Hi, I'm Peter Tragos, host of the Lawyer You Know podcast and YouTube channel. The saying goes, everyone hates lawyers until you need one. Well, I'm here when you need one to answer your questions and give you insight that you didn't know you needed. Along with my partners, Pete Sardis, the professor, who has a finance and business background, and George Tragos, my dad, and the conciliary, a criminal defense giant, we can answer any questions you have. What's up, everybody? We are here to talk about two of my favorite subjects, golf and the law. The Live Golf Series has finally fired its first shot at the PGA Tour after a lot of threats, a lot of money going around, a lot of comments being made publicly uh, by PGA Tour players, by Live Golf players, and we knew eventually it was going to come to a head and somebody was going to file a lawsuit. Now, many people are saying the timing of this lawsuit is purely because the FedEx Cup playoffs are coming out, uh, are coming up soon, and some of these players want to be in on that because they actually have qualified. Others have not qualified. Today, we are going to talk about the lawsuit. I'm going to give basically an overview. It's a 106-page lawsuit. I read the entire thing last night, um, and it wasn't even that difficult to get through. I mean, it was really fun to read because it goes into the history of the PGA Tour, the history of competing tours, um, whether or not this is actually a monopoly, what's happened when other tours have popped up, what about some of the other tours that you golf fans out there maybe ha- are familiar with, like the Corn Ferry Tour, the European Tour, the Asian Tour, things like that. Um, there are other tours. Is this really a monopoly? What's the competition look like? Why do we even need competition? So we're going to talk about all that today. I'm not going to read 100 pages of the complaint to you, but I am going to pick out some specifics because there are some shots being fired, some things that I think are, are being uncovered or the veil is being pulled back and we're learning some of the dirty laundry basically of the PGA tour and what it's like. And I think some people are not going to like that. Um, I was surprised reading this at how I felt. I kind of kept going back and forth on this. I don't really have uh, a pure stance yet. I kind of think I know where I lean and, and Sparrow, I saw you say, didn't know this one, which side are we on? Um, I think we'll find out. I know some people are feel very strongly on both sides of this discussion, and I am going to talk about some of the um, non-golf-related issues that people have brought up, some of them legitimate, some of them not. And we're going to answer, I'm going to kind of do this in a way that I think will break it down best for everybody as kind of an overview. I'm going to talk about who the plaintiffs are, what the PGA Tour is, what the plaintiffs want, why they filed this lawsuit. We will look at their prayer for relief. Why do we want competition? Like I mentioned in the beginning, what does competition actually look like? What does blocking competition look like in a monopoly? We'll talk a little bit about what the players are saying publicly. And then some other general objections people have to this live golf league. So hopefully you guys are here for this kind of content. If you are like the video, I don't expect it to be a huge boondoggle of views or anything like that. This is one that I was surprised at how many questions I got. So I finally decided to dive in and and talk about it because obviously it's something I'm interested in for any of you out there that don't know. I'm very into golf, my favorite sport and hobby and thing to do. I am wearing a shirt from Glen Eagles today. Um, But, you know, this is content I'm interested in. So if you guys are interested in it, that'd be awesome. Let me know what questions you have as we go. I got some questions on Twitter. Bev, I'm going to answer your question as we go throughout. And a couple others that asked me on Twitter are built into kind of my outline of things to talk about today. So uh, like the video if you do like this content and let me know your questions in the comments. I'm sure everybody's already subscribed that's here for this. If it gets a lesser amount of interest, we may turn it into kind of a members only type of content because I know a lot of the members like throwing up the golf emoji and talking golf on our members community page. So all of that could be coming and all of that to jump in to this lawsuit. So the first thing I want to talk about is, and I'm not even on page one here, who are the plaintiffs? Okay. I keep making this 150 and it keeps going down. All right. Who are the plaintiffs in this case? Cause it's not the entire live golf league. It's not all of the ex-PGA Tour or European Tour players or Corn Ferry Tour players that came over. It is it is these 11 players. I think it's 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yes. Some of them you'll recognize more than others, like Phil Mickelson. 
Taylor Gooch having a good season, Hudson Swafford, Matt Jones, Bryson, Bryson DeChambeau. Everybody's heard of him, right? Abraham Answer, really good player. Carlos Ortiz, Ian Poulter, longtime stalwart on, you know, the Ryder Cup teams for the world or Europe or whatever they're calling them these days. Um, Pat Perez, very interesting and cool character. Also a very good player. Jason Kokrak, who's had a really good couple seasons. And Peter Yulian, I don't know who that is. I think he is the Corn Ferry Tour player, which we'll talk about some of the differences there as to how he's involved versus PGA Tour Inc. So what is the PGA Tour, right? That is a question they answer in this lawsuit. Let me go down to the parties page. And where they get to the defendant here. Defendant PGA Tour is a Maryland nonprofit corporation with its principal place of business in Ponte Vedra, Florida. The PGA Tour sponsors a season-long series of golf tournaments throughout the calendar year called the PGA Tour. Those events occur primarily in the United States. In the 2021-22 PGA Tour season, the tour sponsored events in 20 states, including six events in California. Tours engaged in interstate commerce. This They filed this in California. So that's why they, they mentioned how many are in California. So it is a nonprofit corporation. That's interesting. Number two, none of these players on the PGA Tour are employees. They are all independent contractors. And when you file for a nonprofit, as they talk about in this complaint, you have to say kind of what the purpose of your nonprofit is. And their purpose is to grow the game, to support competition, to provide some great viewing pleasures for the fans, things like that. That is the purpose of the PGA Tour. We're going to talk about how the Live Golf members don't necessarily think that that's true and what they do. The, the PGA Tour, another thing that's interesting is a lot of the players on the PGA Tour are owners, as they say. And that's one of the issues we'll talk about at the end as other issues. But the players sometimes own and sponsor and put on these golf tournaments but they cannot do it without the okay or the blessing of the PGA tour. They sign a independent contract with the PGA tour that doesn't allow them to do certain things with those tournaments that they apparently own or are charity tournaments. And the money goes to charity, which some of it does. Absolutely. And the PGA tour is absolutely the biggest and the best golf league in the world. Every other tour is a stepping stone to the PGA tour. Nothing compares to it. The purses are bigger, meaning the money that you can, that can be won there, the majors and the championships. And the big point throughout this complaint is the official world golf rankings, OWGR. Those points that you get is what allows you to play in certain tournaments, especially the majors, allows you to become a champion, allows you to get notoriety, TV time, endorsement deals, money, become rich, famous, and the best golfers of all time. A lot of it centers around the official world golf rankings. That is a huge sticking point in this because Liv can't do anything about that. They can't get into the, if, if the PGA tour does not officially own those rankings or control those rankings, we'll talk about how, what control they do have, have over those, but Liv realized at this point, no points for their tournaments and no points for their tournaments really makes it difficult to compete with the PGA tour. Okay. So the live golf guys. Oh, I forgot to mention. Who did you notice that is not a plaintiff? Not all 48 or 72. I think there's 72 total players on the live tour because they have 48 that play every week and then they have 24 alternates. If somebody can't play, they slide them in and those 48 play against each other. Um, for a little bit of background, if you literally have no clue what's going on, the live tour backed by Saudi money, their commissioner is Greg Norman, huge P PGA tour hall of famer. Um, who is not new to trying to start competitive leagues to the PGA tour. I think he's tried it two or three other times this time. He's got bigger, deeper pockets behind him with this Saudi money. Um, and we'll talk about that as well at the end of some of the other issues with this. Um, so he wanted to create a league that was more fun, different aspects, no cuts. Every player gets paid player, get players get paid more money. If you don't know how the PGA tour works. If you don't make the cut to the weekend, you don't get paid. Um, if you're not in the top, however many for whatever the rules are of that tournament, you don't get paid for that weekend. You just go home unpaid. Live one to change that. All 48 players play three rounds, not four. There are no cuts. You get paid bigger purses. Players get more money. Uh, fun things for the fans where you have captains and teams and there are team points. 
um, as well as individual points. Teams win money. Individuals win money. Captains can sponsor things. They want to do some stuff with microphones. It's almost like a crossover with some YouTube golf. If you've seen YouTube golf, um, if you watch any of them like Rick Shields or Peter Finch or Good Good Golf or any of those YouTube golf channels, I think they want to mix some of that in. And they're actually getting a lot of ideas from the YouTube golf channels. Live one to be kind of a cutting edge, different tour than the old stale PGA tour, as they put it. Not me. I love watching the PGA tour. So the PGA tour obviously doesn't want that. They don't want that competition. They think it's going to water down um, their product and, you know, obviously take money away from them. And that's where the fight ensues. So the PGA tour has entered bans, partial bans, you know, suspensions, potential lifetime bans to any player that agrees to go to the live tour among other things, which we'll get to. So knowing all of that as kind of a very brief background. And if you have more questions, I am more than happy to answer your questions. I actually think answering your questions will be the best way to reference this complaint versus me just going through the complaint. But I do think it's important that we know as always, when we see somebody file a complaint, I always say, if you're a good lawyer, after you read their legal document, you should be like, Oh, that makes sense. I think they should win. And I think the live golf lawyers did a good job with this complaint, but let's talk about what they actually want. Do I still have it up here? No, I do. Okay, good. All right. Relief requested. Stay and enjoin the PD PGA tours suspensions and sanctions imposed on plaintiffs. So we learn so much and can build so much on other cases. You all already know what an injunction is and what it means to enjoin something. And that means to stop it, to pause it, to stay it. Just pause these suspensions until we can actually have a court um, have a court determine whether or not it's fair and whether or not they impose these sanctions and suspensions appropriately. Let's pause it so they don't they're not irreparably harmed. They don't lose tons of money winning the FedEx Cup playoffs. They could lose $10 million in the PIP program. They can lose tons of money in endorsements. It can affect their points for future majors and future tournaments. All of this is intertwined, and that is true. If you get suspended for 21 months, it's a huge problem in the PGA Tour because you build on, especially if you're young in your career, you're building points up. You're building notoriety up. You win a tournament. You get into the Champions Tournament. You get into a major based off points. You get into these FedEx Cup playoffs. You win not only millions of dollars, but it sets you up for your career in the future because you can always lose your PGA Tour card and all sorts of things can happen. So these kind of bans are incredibly serious. And they do seem like something that should be stayed until we get it right. Okay. Until we make sure we get it right. And as long as everything was copacetic and due process was in place, then go ahead, ban them. But let's make sure we get it right before we crush some careers before they even get started. Phil Mickelson's a little bit different. He's on the back end. We all get that. We understood it when it happened. Good night. I keep forgetting to get to my point as to who was not listed as a plaintiff. We'll do it after, after this section. Um, so yeah, so so that's something that has actually been enjoined by a court before. Ian Poulter and some players with the European Tour, when they were going to ban them from a certain tournament, they went uh, in front of an arbiter and they asked and said, this is unfair that they're blocking us from this tour event because we joined Live. We tried to appeal it. They wouldn't let us appeal it. They violated our due process and the arbiter actually agreed with them. And the court enjoined the European tour and said, you cannot suspend Ian Poulter based off a of technicality because of due process. They're not saying that you can't do it ever. They're just saying the way that you did it was legally improper. So Ian Poulter and those guys got to go play in that European tour event. I wouldn't be surprised if something like something similar to that happened with paragraph a here, not meaning the live tour wins, not meaning the live golf players win, but just that we make sure we get it legally right. It's so hot in here today. I don't know if my AC is not working or it's a thousand degrees in Florida. Um, okay. So pause before we get to the next relief granted. Three of the biggest names on the live golf tour series, whatever you want to call it, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, and Patrick Reed are not plaintiffs in this lawsuit. There's a lot of things you can draw from that, but it's very interesting. Because some of the PGA Tour players are feeling personally attacked like they have been personally sued by these plaintiffs. And maybe some of them didn't want to burn that bridge. I don't know. We'll probably find out later why some of these are. Because it's not just the ones that qualified for the playoffs and they want to get this injunction so they can go play in the playoffs because some of these plaintiffs didn't even qualify for the playoffs. One of them's not even in the PGA Tour. 
So it is interesting to kind of see who is on the plaintiff's line and who's not. All right, what else do they want? B, prevent the PGA Tour from banning or threatening to ban from the PGA Tour or its affiliated tours players who talk to, contract with, play in, or associate with Live Golf. So they want to stop tortious interference with contract, basically. Uh, prevent the PGA Tour from expelling players from the PGA Tour or PGA Tour tournaments who talk to, contract with, Blah, blah, blah. Stop trying to ban this. Um, prevent the PGA Tour from threatening or imposing other punishments on anyone who talks to, contracts with. Prevent the PGA Tour from conspiring or unlawfully agreeing with the European Tour to ban or threaten players from participating in the European Tour events or participating in the Ryder Cup for talking to, contracting with, etc. So basically, they're asking over and over again in different ways to make this court, actually they demand a jury trial, to make the court do some things and a jury decide certain things that the PGA cannot block, lean into, threaten, ban, sanction, fine, not only the players, but their agents. There's some evidence of them actually blocking agencies and finding agencies and taking away their press credentials. Vendors, like as simple as who puts up the tents at the Live Golf Tour, the PGA Tour leaned into him and said, if you put up the tents for live, we will never use you as a vendor again. Who puts up the shot tracers, you know, where we can see the lines, which that's not proprietary because again, I've seen YouTube golfers do it, but they tried to talk to the pro tracer series or whatever it's called. And they said they couldn't because of the pressure the PGA Tour put on them and the PGA Tour would stop working with them. And this is what these players want to block. They want to stop the PGA Tour from amending its rules to prevent players that were otherwise eligible from playing to not being able to play. What they're talking about there is throughout the complaint, they talk about how uh, Jay Monahan, who's this complaint is littered with his name in quotes, he actually changed rules to make it harder for players to join the Live Tour, actually impossible. And he has changed verbiage just on the fly to their rules to make it even harder. Like instead of just in America, it's in the world and other edits like that to just blanket. And he is unabashedly saying it's because we want to block the live tour. And we're going to get to some of his quotes later. Um, again, more event, um, amending their rules, preventing them from enforcing its unlawful restrictions on independent contractor golfers, including media rights regulations and conflicting events regulations. So let's talk about this because this is their two big arguments as how they try to limit what these golfers who are independent contractors can do and why it's a monopoly. First, the media rights regulation. Basically what that says is you can't play in any events that are televised, promoted, that people can watch unless it's the PGA Tour or unless we say it's okay. And we don't say the Live Golf Tour is okay, therefore you can't play on the Live Golf Tour or you're out of the PGA Tour. Conflicting events regulation. This one's interesting. So there's a rule that all these golfers agree to that they will not play in an event that conflicts with a PGA Tour event. And you say, okay, that seems fair. Except most of us just watch the big tournaments, right? Some watch more than others, but the majors or whatever, you know, the big points ones, FedEx Cup, playoff series, the the one-on-one -on -one matchups that they do, whatever it may be. But there's a PGA Tour event, I think, 48 weeks of the year. So basically every single week across the world basically means the conflicting events regulation, you can't play in any other tour unless the PGA Tour says it's okay. And there are a lot of examples in this complaint to where customarily in the past, if it was a European Tour event or an Asian Tour event, the PGA Tour would be like, yeah, sure, fine. You can go play in that, no problem. But with Live, they're saying no, because it is a direct competitor of the PGA Tour. Again, very interesting. Uh, amending their rules. Yeah, enjoying the PGA, meaning file an injunction, stop them from doing all this stuff. That's what they're asking for a judge and a jury to do in this case. So that is what they want. That is their prayer for relief. Let's see here. All right. So the decisions that have to be made in this case. Is there competition? 
What do you guys think? Is there a competition with the PGA Tour? Because when you look across, there are other tours. There's the European Tour, Corn Ferry Tour, Canadian Tour, Asian Tour. There are other tours. But a number of those tours, including the Corn Ferry Tour, are literally a stepping stone to the PGA Tour. The PGA Tour actually owns that tour. But when we have the European Tour, the PGA Tour does not own that tour. However, this complaint makes it evidently clear that the PGA Tour basically tells the European Tour what to do. And when the European Tour even thinks about doing something that's adverse to the PGA Tour, the PGA Tour lets them know. And I believe Jay Monahan is either on the board or has some decision-making power in the European Tour. And the European Tour has also told the Live Golf Series Tour, whatever, and other vendors that they partner with the, with the PGA Tour. They have a partnership, which the Live Golf Tour says is absolutely illegal. And they basically say that the PGA Tour controls the entire golf ecosystem. The RNA club, the majors, they talk a lot about the majors. Now the PGA tour is really putting pressure on the major tournaments to not allow these live, live golf players in. Now we know the open just happened and live golf players were all over the place. And that was a big talk of the town. They're trying to put pressure on those majors to also not allow that. We already know Ryder cup, president's cup, you're out. Henrik Stenson, I think was going to be the captain or a very important player on the European team or the world team out because he joined the, the live Tour. I don't think he was a plaintiff in this case either. Some of the biggest best golfers um, were not plaintiffs in this in this case, but they are getting serious punishments and ramifications. Now we all know a lot of them are sizing for lots of money, like hundreds of millions of dollars. So when we think about it, generally we're like, that's yeah, a business decision. You know, if somebody offered me a job for hundred million bucks, maybe I'd just say yes and be like, okay, I'm going to play for for you. Um. All right, let's see what else we got. All right, so is there a competition? There are these other tours. Doesn't really seem like they compete with the PGA Tour, though. They're not trying to take players from the PGA Tour. And there will be some quotes later from Rory McIlroy, who's on the board of the PGA Tour. There are some player board members, and he's one of them, and he's been the face, and he's been coming out hard against the Live Golf Tour. That he even said, and lots of golfers said, all these other tours are set, including the European tour, which is a competitor and not a feeder. He and all the other golfers agree. They are stepping stones to get to the PGA tour, like minor league baseball, double a triple a high, a whatever you want to get to the show. Now they have antitrust exemption. So we know that, but very interesting on whether or not this is actual real competition or if it's just people bowing to the monopoly of the PGA tour. That's, a, that's an open question. Why do we want competition? Why is that important? Does anybody know? Why do you think we would want a competitive league? What's the problem if there's only one Monopoly PGA Tour? Why is that a big deal? What do you guys think? Because what they answered and talked about in this complaint is twofold, basically. First, fair pricing and available content for fans. You know, when we see toilet paper go away and, you know, price gouging, basically that's what it is, price gouging. They don't want there to be, you know, the PGA Tour can charge astronomical amounts for tickets and not put the content on. Uh, I do think it's weird that so many tournaments, the early rounds, you know, rounds one and two, or even practice rounds or things that people would watch, myself included, especially at like the Masters. I'd watch every practice round and they're available on ESPN Plus and stuff, but most of the time it's behind paywalls. And that's interesting to me, especially when you compare it with football and basketball and baseball, where it's on ABC, ESPN, Fox, you know, whatever, cable channels. Why isn't golf more like that? Yet since the pressure of the Live Golf Tour, it's become more available. And that's something else that's very interesting. Competition breeds that and, and makes it so the competitor says, oh, they're going to be on TNT? They're going to be free for people to watch. More people are going to watch that than have to pay for the PGA Tour channel and watch the PGA Tour events there. That's why we as fans want competition. Additionally, the PGA Tour, according to the complaint, has started copying some of the ideas of the Live Tour. 
They're going to do some teams and some pairing events and some non-cut events and some exhibitions with bigger purses. Where'd they get those ideas? Maybe the Live Golf Tour. So for the fans, they're trying to create a better fan experience. Really interesting to think about. I came into this complaint, I don't want to say 100%, but mostly on the side of the PGA Tour. Um, just, just saying that. And, and reading all this, it's, it's making me think, you know, I still think the PGA Tour will win ultimately. I don't feel confident about that. I feel like they'll win, um, that there will be sufficient competition. But it is making me think about why we do want legitimate competition. I don't think I've ever watched a European Tour, Asian Tour, Corn Ferry Tour event ever, except for the the one Corn Ferry Tour where I played in the Pro Am and then watched the event after. But I, so I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't really think it's real competition. But okay, the second part of why we want competition. Fair compensation for players. I guess I can pull this off the screen for now. Fair compensation for players. What does that mean? Of course, I pulled it off the screen right as I want to show you guys some stuff. So this is interesting to me. Getting a million text messages right now for some reason. All right. Um, all right, here we go. All right. Despite offering a stagnant product with a shrinking fan base, shots taken throughout the complaint, uh, the tour, which is the PGA tour has used its monopoly position to extract substantially increased revenues from broadcasters and advertisers as a monopsonist. However, the tour has not passed those increased revenues through to its members. Again, they're nonprofit. For example, and the, the players are the owners. Uh, for example, the tour's revenue has increased from 2011 to 2019 by 163%. Yet the share of revenue it provides to its members fell substantially. It's because there's no competition for player services. A player can't say, I'm going to go play for the European tour because the PGA tour would laugh at them, literally. But the Live Golf Tour, maybe with the Saudi money and Greg Norman allowing the tour to direct its increased revenues into its bloated bureaucracy, extravagant facilities, and multi-million dollar compensation and lavish perks for Commissioner Monaghan and the other executives who run the monopoly rather than sharing them with players. So this is one of the big dirty secrets that they really talk about. How much Monaghan gets paid, his lavish perks, all the executives that are making so much money off PGA Tour and are blatantly saying they want to smash all competition because... They don't care. I mean, the golfers, yes, great. Good golfers, good tournaments, keep making money. But if there is legit competition, maybe their jobs would be at stake. Maybe they would make less money. Maybe there would be more pressure on them to make change. Change is difficult. So that's a very interesting thing to me. Tour data shows that average tour purses grew an anemic 2.5% per year on average from 2014 to 2019, from 6.6 .6 million to 7.4 million. By comparison, the total salary pool for other major professional sports grew at much stronger rates for the same period, 15% per year for the NFL, 8% per year for the NBA, 4% per, per year for the NHL, even though they started at a higher point. So interesting to me. Why aren't the players taking a bigger percentage of the money brought in by the PGA Tour? Is it because of lack of competition? Well, let's talk about how much these players actually make compared to other uh, professional sports. The tour has failed to offer its members compensation on par with professional athletes in other sports. The number one player on the tour money list in 2019 was Brooks Kepka. Why did they pick that year? Probably because it was Brooks Kepka who was in the Live Golf Tour with $9.68 million in tournament winnings. His winnings were the equivalent to the 129th pay, highest paid NFL player, 121st played NBA paid highest paid NBA player, 128th highest paid MLB player. So 120 players in every other sport basically makes more money than Brooks Kepka. I noticed how they left the NHL off of this. Did you guys notice that? Didn't it didn't fit their argument? Um, but I'm pretty sure Chase Daniels, the the backup quarterback that's been around forever, I'm pretty sure he makes right around as much money as uh, Brooks Kepka, and he never plays in an NFL game. Um, so that is interesting. It's interesting. Would that change it? Well, let's hear what Joel Damon had to say about that. 
does this pressure, does the live golf tour actually create competition and increase that money that players could make? In response to increased competition for the PGA Tour, players recognize the threat of competition. I appreciate the fact there is competition and leverage, blah, blah, blah. Where's the Joel Damon quote? Here it is. The PGA Tour magically comes up with $40 million for the player empowerment program, and then they're paying us all fifty grand to play 15 events, which is another X million dollars. That's like $50 million they just magically found laying around overnight. The money is there. There's a way to do it. And what he's referencing is the PGA Tour, since the pressure of the Live Tour, has added $50 million in prize money that they are going to give to the players. There are other references throughout the complaint where since the Live Tour is coming and the pressure from it, the PGA Tour is actually giving more money to the players, responding to that competition, proving Live Golf's point. So what does competition actually look like? We've kind of talked about it. Nothing illegal about being the biggest or the best. But you can't control everything. And this lawsuit talks about how if the PGA Tour leans into something, the vendors, the smaller tours, the TV broadcasts, advertisers, and even agents have to fall in line or the PGA Tour can literally crush them. Literally crush them. And that's not really what we want. All right. All right. What does blocking competition look like? Okay. And this is where we're going to get just some, I'll go through it kind of quickly here. We're at 30 minutes. Usually I like for these to be about an hour. Um, all right. Some Monaghan quotes. PGA Tour Commissioner Jane Monaghan. He's made it clear that rule changes were expressly designed to enable the tour to foreclose competition. The tour is doing everything it possibly can to block competition is the rest of that quote. While the tour has historically granted releases, like I talked about before, they've taken a different stance regarding Live Golf, denying it. And he even confessed that he has departed from past practice in prohibiting members from the PGA Tour and Live Golf events outside North America. For example, he wrote in his 2020 strategy memorandum that they actually have that he wrote that the best way to prevent a competitor from emerging from the PGA Tour members, including plaintiffs from, sorry, from emerging is to prevent the players, including the plaintiffs, from supporting the new promoter. Because the impact it could have on the PGA Tour is dependent on the level of support it receives from players. You can't have the best competition if you don't have the best players, right? Pretty simple. And Liv actually did a good job of explaining how they had this business plan in place and they had to scrap it and do a smaller thing in 2022 because of everything the PGA Tour did. They also talked about, I think, a league in 1994 and, and in the 2000s that Greg Norman tried to do this. He even had Fox behind him at some point, and the PGA Tour crushed it back then. But now he's got more money. So here we go. Without a fair process, again, that could be referencing the arbitration that happened in Europe. Uh, Jay Monahan imposed 21-month tour suspensions on the plaintiffs for exercising their independent contractor rights to play in the first two live golf events. Uh, the top 30 golfers in the world are all in the PGA Tour. They talk about how it's absolutely the biggest and the best. Let's see what else we have. So the OWGR's governing board, right? We talked about how the golf uh, world rankings points, how the PGA Tour didn't own it, but let's see who's on their board. Well, you guessed it, Jay Monahan. Who else? The CEO of the European Tour, Keith Pelly. The general counsel for the European Tour, the COO of the European Tour, the CEO of the PGA of America, the executive director of the United States Golf Association, all people that listen to Jay Monahan and that he has leaned on in the past for their support against Live Golf.
he, they talk about this monopoly manifesto. I can't imagine that's actually what it's called. Um, let's see. Yeah, he's even said that he's not going to let people play on the Live Golf Tour because it competes with the PGA Tour. He will enforce or impose strict enforcements with conflicting events and media rights. We already talked about what that is and how it's about impossible for any golfer to go play for any other legitimate tour if it competes with the media rights and the conflicting events. I mean, it must be a pretty crazy independent contract. I haven't ever seen the independent contract. Um, I think you guys get the gist of this. All of his quotes throughout, basically doing everything he can to block a competitive tour, a legitimately competitive tour. His quotes throughout the complaint, in my opinion, are the most damning parts for the PGA. All right. We already heard what Joel Damon's saying. Let's hear what some of the other players are saying, like Rory McIlroy. He even said, the European tour is a stepping stone. Um, where is it where he talked about competition? Yeah, here we go. This is an interesting one. Uh, Rory McIlroy who is president of the Players Advisory Council and a PGA Tour board member, recognized that competition is a good thing and any business needs competition for things to progress and move on. Now, he was probably saying it like, we have that competition and it is good for us, but they're using it to say we really need real competition. Uh, Jordan Spieth, who is another golden boy of the PGA Tour. Did I spell that wrong? Spieth. Um, he said... I think as a player overall, the competition from the live golf will benefit us. I can only say from my point of view that I think it's beneficial to the players to have competition. Ricky Fowler said, I think competition is a good thing. And in business, whatever it may be, if you're trying to be the best, you find a way that you can be better than your competitors, right? I agree with all of this. It goes through sport, business, tours, whatever it may be. These tours or leagues, however you want to classify them, they wouldn't really be coming up if they didn't see that there were more that there was more opportunity out there. I've always looked at competition as being a good thing. It's a driving force of our game, right? That's what these players do every day. They compete. Will Zalatoris, Zalatoris and uh, Billy Horschel, they had some interesting comments as well. I, I listened to some interviews for them. And they are very anti-Live Golf, but what they say is, and this is a good sentiment and argue, argument for the PGA. You know what you're getting into if you go play for Live Golf. So why don't you just go play for Live Golf? Why do you have to play for both? They also say, you said you joined Live to play less golf. Only 15 events a year, 14 events a year. But then you also want to play on the PGA, which makes you play at least 15 events a year. So you're going to play 29. That's actually more golf. Uh, they were also saying, you know, if they go do their cash grab, that's up to them. They can go do that if they want to. More power to them, but don't come try to keep playing in this tour. So that's an interesting concept. The PGA Tour is not saying the Live Golf Tour can't exist. They're just telling their independent contractors that you can't play for both. That's kind of like a non-compete, right? The media rights and the, the competition rights, that's just like a non-compete at the end of the day. You can play for live if you want. We're not throwing you in jail. You just can't come back here. You can pick which one do you want to be a part of. But where it comes, where the issues come in is what they're doing to vendors and other outside sources to me. That's where it potentially limits competition. But they can tell the vendors the same thing. I mean, think about what any business you're in. And if you could try to be like, no, if you work with my competitors, I don't want to work with you. And generally, people are okay with that. You can choose to work with who you want to work with. I, I hear a lot of people talking about the money. We are getting to that. Jan, I just saw you comment that as well. We are getting that. That is literally my next point. Other objections. I'll save the money to last. Double dipping. They get annoyed if players want to double dip and go for some of the money here and some of the money there. Fine. Cherry picking, which is, which is more interesting to me. Some guys like Bryson DeChambeau, who have already made it to a certain level on the PGA Tour, then may start cherry picking and go playing the Live Tour to get the big purses and then just the majors and the big tournaments in the PGA Tour, and they start cherry picking. What's the big deal with that? Well, there's a reason the PGA Tour makes you play 15 events for most golfers. There are exemptions, of course, because they want you to support the other tournaments. And we talked about player-owned tournaments. If nobody showed up for the smaller tournaments, 
that would suck and it wouldn't be good for the PGA Tour. So that's why they make these players show up and support the PGA Tour as a whole. Another issue, in some of the old golf leagues or prior competitors, the PGA Tour has actually said, sure, we'd be okay with that as long as the PGA Tour gets a cut and as long as everything you do goes through our say first, which is obviously not a legitimate competitor. So the PGA Tour has offered to allow it and, you know, if somebody will kiss the ring, as they say. Last, okay, the Saudi money. I know this is an absolutely legit gripe, absolutely legitimate. But I want us to be reasonable and fair and what is the word I'm looking for? Not pessimistic about it, but we'll be a realist about it. Okay, we're going to be realistic about this money. I, I, I have read lots of articles. I don't ever want any dirty money or blood money or whatever it is that you want to call it. I don't know what people describe or define as that kind of money, but it's a very touchy subject. But here's what I want to show you in this complaint that I find very interesting. While the tour and those it has leaned on now, that they have leaned on, now use the Saudi sponsorship of Live Golf as a weapon to smear golfers, including the plaintiffs, who play in live golf events and justify their attacks on the golfers. Mr. Paley, if you remember, he's the CEO or commissioner of the European Tour. Statements reveal that attacks on the Saudi sponsorship of live golf are a pure pretext. And we know what a pretext is based on the Twitter complaint. It is a fake reason that uh, you're doing what you're really doing because what you're really doing is actionable or illegal or unlawful. The tour had no problem entering into a partnership with the European tour at the same time that the European tour co-sanctioned the Saudi international. And while Mr. Pelly gushed about the prospect of partnering with golf Saudi to grow the sport and the tour. And that did happen. And there were some issues at the time, but a lot of the players still did it. And the PGA store tour still partnered with it. And the tour has no problem accepting its own sponsorship money from companies, and this is the important part that I've pointed out to a lot of people privately, just my friends that I talk about with this, that do billions of dollars in business with Saudi Arabia each year. An estimated 23 PGA Tour sponsors conduct regular business with Saudi Arabia each year at an estimated $40 billion of business with Saudi Arabia. PGA Tour eagerly does business with these companies while criticizing golfers for playing on a tour primarily sponsored by the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia is the height of his hypocrisy and exposes a pretext. I've said this lots of times. I'm all for being for a cause, doing what's right. Oh gosh, I didn't have it on the screen. Sorry, guys. Here it is. I was reading... Uh, paragraph 131, if you guys want to read it on your own. So this is the issue I have. All sports leagues, and I would hazard to guess any billion dollar company or industry is taking money from somebody doing something we would not agree with. That's morally reprehensible. Different countries around the world have different morals and values I guarantee you I could find something you don't agree with, with every bank your money is with, with, I don't want to, I don't want to name any specific businesses, but they're calling out hypocrisy here. I like how they didn't name the 23 companies. If you want my honest opinion, they did not name and shame the 23 PGA tour sponsors, which they could, because they obviously counted them and listed them. They could have named them and said, all of you are doing business with the Saudis and nobody has a problem with that. I, I, I do have a problem and that's why I have really haven't focused on the money part. I'm trying to focus on, on legal aspects. The same thing with, Oh, it's not less golf. It's more golf. You're being a hypocrite. Like the PGA tour players calling the live tour players, hypocrites by double dipping or wanting to play more golf, not left less or really going for a cash grab. But none of that 
legally has any basis on antitrust and things like that. But this, this smear campaign based on this, to me, I have difficulty really getting up in arms about the money the live golf players are getting paid through versus the PGA Tour versus the NBA versus the NFL versus whatever. You remember the NBA China stuff that came up not too long ago and that just went away. A lot of people have problems with that money. So I just caution people from really going wild on the money aspect of this. And the only reason it legally is relevant is if they are using it as a smear campaign to crush competition and lean on sponsors and say, if you do, we'll tell them that you're taking money from the Saudis as, re as well. Blair said, Pete, it's always about the money. It is from both sides. And I'm just for like, you know, free agency, players switching teams, going, getting the best contract. If that's what this turns into with, you know, live golf, it's like I can make more money there. But if not, I'll come back to the PGA Tour if I think I can make more money on the PGA Tour. Maybe we'll have somebody show out on the live tour and that'll be like, wow, maybe they can win some majors in the PGA Tour. Stuff like that could be cool for fan. Like, is this not for fan? It's golf, right? They're not curing cancer. They're not running countries. They're not helping poor people. They're not serving widows and orphans. I, I know they give money to charity, of course, but you know, this is golf. So at the end of the day, the players should get paid the money because they're the product and the fans should get the benefit of the best product and innovation and, you know, conversations between caddies and players. Why is that so secret? That would be fun for us to listen to. So that's, that's kind of my overview and breakdown. I would love to talk about this more. So if you guys are interested, please let me know. If you're part of the rewatch crew, let me know in the comments what parts this you interested in. We are going to get to some questions now. Veto land, this lawsuit was made specifically for Peter. I kind of feel like that. I do, I do love it. Elizabeth Gangora, lawyer, you know, love how you decorated your office with all the gifts you've received. Yes, I'm glad you noticed that. I'm not going to point out any specifically because, you know, YouTube may or may not have limited ads for some of my gifts. Um, but yes, I'm going to continue to do that. I want to build everything back here based on YouTube. Um, I have some plaques and stuff back there now until I, I get more stuff from all you guys because it's so cool and it's a way to celebrate you. Uh, Ashley Ducharme, did you see Live Offer Tiger 7 or 8 or million? All day, every day, be worth every penny. This is what that tells me, Ashley. It's interesting you point this out. So what's the PGA Tour promising Tiger and players like Tiger? Because at the drop of a hat, Tiger Woods could create an, a, an alternate golf league. Anybody he called, I honestly believe that if he called some sponsor that was a sponsor of PGA Tour and PGA Tour said, if you go with Tiger, you're out, they'd be like, peace, I'm going with Tiger. But Tiger's also smart. So I think he's getting a lot from PGA Tour. I think he's getting plenty of money, obviously, that he doesn't need. But they've also stuck up for him because Tiger's hit some bumps in the road publicly. But it's never really been that bad. And they've always kind of stayed behind him. I know Nike dropped him at some point, I think, and then came back um, or some sponsors. But the PGA Tour has always kind of stayed behind Tiger. They've welcomed him back with open arms. They haven't been hard on him when they had the opportunity to. So I think there is some loyalty there as well. <laughs> Elsa, uh, I didn't read the title. I thought it was alive of you playing golf. That'd be fun. Maybe we'll do that someday. Azam, I don't even know what LIV stands for, actually. I don't know if it's just for the Roman numerals. I don't know what it stands for. I'll have to look that up. Lori Mall, do you have to have the points in order to be able to qualify for tournaments? Yes, some of them. Yes. So again, if a player wants to make that decision to go play on the LIV tour and they don't get the points, fine. But if they do qualify, they want to be able to play for the tour. I can understand this argument, honestly, from both sides. Like, Pick which tour you want to be a part of. If you pick the live tour, you can't play in the PGA tour. I understand that. I'm cool with that. Like I, I can, I can get behind that. I can, I can get behind that. You pick. Now, I don't know if I love that you have a lifetime ban and you can never go back if you don't like it on the live tour. You know, I, I wouldn't want that for the players I like watching. Um, but this is, it's, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Diane Brown. I'm loving this. Thanks for covering it. Thank you, Diane. Doug D isn't the PGA contract pretty much making golf in the u.s a monopoly if they're trying to stop live that's what live is saying we'll see what the courts say let's 
So Liv is the Roman numeral number 54. Oh, is that how many players it is? Not 48, 54. I may have gotten that detail wrong. Oh, 54 holes in the tournament. Okay, that's what the 54 is where that makes sense. Yeah, because they only play three rounds. They don't play 72 like the PGA Tour. That's one of their things. Okay, that makes sense. Why should the PGA Tour have these sorts of power monopoly? They shouldn't. And that's the point is how far does this power actually go for a nonprofit organization whose commissioner makes tons of money, whose players make hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and they do give some money to charity. But that would be like if I said, hey, guys, give all this money to me, and I will give some of it to charity, and I give a dollar to charity, and I become rich off of it. But it's not a nonprofit. I'm just paying for my services as the CEO of this nonprofit. I do think you all would throw up if you saw how much some of these board members make um, for nonprofit organizations. <laughs> Kaya, so they own golf. Kind of feels like that. Joe Gottman, why does it matter if they play for other tours that they should support each other? So there's an interesting aspect to this, Joe. I see Law and Lumber Rob commented. I can't wait to get to that one. Um, it's an interesting concept because they don't want to water down or diminish the product they own. And every league, NBA, MLB, um, well, specifically the, M ML or the NBA, a lot of times talk about this revenue sharing and what percentage the players get. The tours percentages they give the players are so much less than every other league. And every dollar that comes in is split between the players and the owners of the NBA or between the players and the tour here. And so every dollar they don't get. So if they go to live and live beats them, then everybody in the tour is making less money. So that's why they don't support that, especially the ones that are already making a lot of money on the PGA tour. And I like, I was like, they're suing the Bev. That's what Bev asked. How do you feel about the fact that they're suing the players? Every league lawsuit and discrepancy and fight the players and everybody else involved eats the cost. So it's no different than any other league, even though they want to make you feel that way. It's really no different than any other league. If the league as a whole loses money on legal fees or some kind of lawsuit or whatever, or viewership goes down or loss of sponsors, the players feel it. The owners feel it. The coaches feel it. Everybody feels it. The PGA tour feels it. Jay Monahan would feel it. Everybody feels it. Law and lumber. Somehow I knew you'd catch that complaint coming through. It's a can't miss for any golf obsessed lawyer. Finally, some content for this tiny corner of the universe. Love it. Yes, this is as niche as it gets, uh, but I'm in on it. I'm in on it. And another one from Rob. Uh, the interesting thing about this, and you have to take the Saudi money stuff out of the thought process. Agreed. This is the first entity big enough to draw attention to PGA practices. Not just that. It's the first one big enough to pay Dustin Johnson, a hundred million bucks before anything even happens. That's wild. And Dustin Johnson has to be confident enough that that check is going to clear and they're just not going to go bankrupt and he's screwed. And now he's a lifetime ban for the PGA tour. That's really what's interesting. Bev PGA tour looks heavy handed and petulant in this. Uh, they called their punishments and their actions draconian throughout the complaint and Monahan's continued hypocritical practice of calling live the Saudi golf league isn't lost on anyone. PGA has numerous Saudi sponsors. It is, it's, it's almost like they want to pull the wool and people on both sides of this, the wool over our eyes as the general public. Like we don't realize that not all money is clean, especially in the world we live in. Uh, pesky pirouette. Do the PGA tour players have collective bargaining like the NFL? I don't believe so. I think they just have independent contracts that they sign. They don't have a player's union like major league baseball. All right. I've got about eight more minutes. Uh, Truffle Hound. Interesting. Peter came in on the side of the PGA. Peter is American. I came in on the side of Liv. I'm Irish Australian. So let, let me say what I mean by the side of PGA. I don't like anybody that stifles competition. I don't like anybody that stifles the ability for somebody to go make as much money as they can. What I don't like, I, I shouldn't say what I don't like. That, that's how my mind changed. But my thought process on being on the side of the PGA is if you want to ban them for going and playing with a competitor for a competitor, I think that should be okay. I don't think you should be forced to give money and potentially support your competitor. That's how I came into it. Meaning if Bryson Sham wants to go play for live, go for it, dude. Good luck to you. You can't come back here though. But what I don't like is blocking sponsorships, 
threatening sports agents. Like if you have some players that play for live, we're going to block your press credentials on, on PGA tour events and try to, so obviously tour players aren't going to want to sign you vendors like tent makers. Like I want to make the tents for the tournament while you can't anymore for us. I mean, that's borderline. Cause I guess you can say only work for me or my competitor, but I don't like them leaning on the European tour and really trying to round everybody else else up to stifle this competition so they can stay at the top. That's where it kind of gets uneasy for me. So when I say I came in on the side of the PGA tour, a lot I'm with a lot of the players that are saying, you want the money, the cash grab, go ahead, go do it, but you can't come back here. Initially, that's kind of where I came in. Uh, Kaya, does that mean endorsements make them more money than prize pool for most players? Yes. Yeah, Jan Lynn said, it's not a question about competition being good or bad. It's a question about the values behind the money invested in live. It's sports washing. No question about it. That's actually not the question, Jan. I get what you're saying. Um, you, may, you may be Jan or Jan, sorry. Um, that may be the question morally for you as to which one you want to watch, which is totally cool. And we are totally okay with that. But legally in this antitrust lawsuit, this is not the question. They are not, nobody's going to try. I don't think anybody's going to try to prove that Americans should not be, or Americans or Europeans or whoever should not be able to accept anything that comes from Saudi money. I think that'd be very interesting if they, if somebody did do something like that. Jan, correct. Notice that the Tour de France was sponsored by Liv as well. So the issue is, of course, should we track all money back to its origins? Jan, this is a question I had years ago and thought about. And it's like, oh, I don't want to go there because they support this or they support that. Or I do want to go here because they support this. It's very hard when you start tracking that back. Karen W. Tiger has the biggest following on the golf course. Absolutely no doubt about it. Angela, what golf shirt are you wearing today? It's Glen Eagles. Beautiful course. When I went to Scotland, though, all the courses we played were like these crazy championship golf courses where they have had the open and major championships at. So Glen Eagles was like not good enough for this guy that planned this golf trip, but it was so beautiful. Truffle Hound, maybe there should be an international body outside of the PGA that runs ranking and takes points from all comp com uh, competitions. That's what the OWGR is supposed to be. But when you look at the board that I read to you, the tour has immense power there. Ben, 54 is the lowest score you can shoot if you were to birdie every hole in a par 72 course. That is true also. 54 has many meanings. 54 is also the lowest score you can have um, going through 54 holes. If you make a hole in one on every hole, right? Throughout the whole tournament, I mean. Yep, negative 18 if you birdie every hole. Sharon, thanks for addressing this. I want to hear more. Good, because I want to talk about it more. Vito Land 92, would you be able to turn down $700, $800 million? So this is a question for all of you, but let me add a qualification to it. If you already had a billion dollars that you couldn't spend if you tried throughout your life, unless you're Elon Musk, I guess. But if you already have billions of dollars and more money coming in and the promise of close to this, like Tiger does and the protection of the PGA tour that Tiger probably has, then I think it's a little bit different for you or I, $700 million, then you'd literally do whatever you want for the rest of your life. Every single day you can help literally millions of people with this. I mean, it'd be pretty tough for me to turn down seven or $800 million. Cause guess what? If it came from a source that I despised, right. And they gave me $700 million. And I was like, man, this is so horrible. I have a moral conflict. Guess what? Me taking that $700 million, and you can disagree with this thinking, and maybe it's dumb thinking, but give me that $700 million. You no longer have it to do whatever it is that you're doing with it that I don't like, and I get to spend it for a good cause or causes that I believe in, seven to the tune of 700 million bones here that I get to now turn into good money. Different, different way of thinking about things. Uh, Priya Onu is a new member. I haven't even talked about the membership. Yes, jump in. We have a lot of golf discussions on the members only content. Um, so check that out. If you guys want to join the membership. Law and Lumber wants to get in on this. I would love to. As more stuff happens, I would love to talk about these lawsuits and what we think about this competition and the laws in our country, how they should or shouldn't control this. Um, when they should or shouldn't step in. So absolutely, we can do some of this together, for sure. Maybe we can do some of this together on the golf course. Even better. As we play, we discuss the live golf uh, lawsuits. 
Corona Dave. I've been playing golf since age eight and I love the PGA tour, but they're backing themselves into a corner. I think their nonprofit status is in peril. I agree with you, Corona Dave. I also saw, I think it was Davis Love say something like, well, you know what? If the courts say like they are the PGA tour, you read this complaint and they are like, they feel like they are above it. It really feels like that to me. They feel like they're above the law. Cause I think Davis Love said something like if the courts tell them, tell us that we have to let them play with us. Well, they can't force our members to show up. So everybody's just not going to show up to the major tournament except for the live golf players. And then good luck with that and see if anybody watches. They're like, I'm going to take my ball and go home. That's kind of what it feels like. It's very interesting. Which would you play for PGA or live or both? If you could definitely both, if I could, because I would assume that would maximize my profits. Um, I think that if I, and here's something else they talk about in the complaint, a lot of younger golfers, lose money playing for the PGA tour. They mentioned one that lost $90,000 and he had his tour card. He made like $30,000 in winnings, but spent $120,000. The reason for that is if you don't make the cut to the weekend, you don't make money. If you don't have endorsement deals and you're not a big time golfer, you don't make money. So that is actually something that can happen if you're on the PGA tour. So if I was one of those golfers who was struggling to make it on the PGA tour, and lit offered me $10 million because they think I have nice hair and they want to put me on camera and I can go get last place and still cash a check every tournament. I'm probably playing for lit. Now, if the PGA tour could prove to me, they don't take a single dollar from anybody that I disagree with what they do. Then morally, I would probably stay with the PGA, but because I think both probably take money that I don't disagree with the origins of the money, but I can take it and do something I do agree with, with it. I would probably go with live if they offered me one of the uh, limited spots because it's guaranteed a lot of money. And this is the ju- this is a job for most players. Now, if I'm Jordan Speed, Tiger Woods, Rory, Rory McElroy, McElroy, I'd probably stay with the PGA Tour. If I'm that kind of elite golfer and I can break Nicholas's records and be one of the greats with Tiger and Arnold Palmer, then I'm probably staying with the PGA Tour. So hopefully that answers your question. I guess my answer is it depends. Azam, thank you for the super sticker. All right, this was really fun. This was really, really fun. Even with a smaller group, I enjoyed the heck out of it. Thank you, everybody that did join the live. Um, Hopefully, you guys hit that like button here. So anybody that is interested in this content can check it out. If you're part of the Rewatch crew, let me know what questions or comments you have in the comments, please. There will be more on this. So hit me up on Instagram and Twitter like you already did with this lawsuit at Tragos Law, and we'll continue talking about it today. Um, And that's it. I appreciate it, guys. I'm out of here.